The city of Demopolis, Alabama, sits atop a cliff at the confluence of the Black Warrior and Tom Bigby Rivers, about 50 miles south of Tuscaloosa. French expatriates were the first of European ancestry to settle here, purchasing the land from the United States government for $2 an acre. Land that had been acquired from the Choctaw several years before, on October 16, 1816, with the Treaty of Fort St. Stephens. American settlers were not far behind. A commercial port was soon established, and due to Demopolis' location, the town became a successful hub for the cotton economy. By the eve of the Civil War, the city had grown from the 70 original settlers to a population of approximately 1,200. Numerous antebellum locations in Demopolis have survived the years, from Bluff Hall and the historic business district to the Glover Mausoleum. But all pale in comparison to the elegance and beauty of a plantation named after one of the men instrumental in the state of Alabama's creation, the Gaineswood Plantation. But this beautiful plantation provides more than just a glimpse into the upper echelons of early Alabama society. It is also the home to one of the state's most infamous ghost stories. The tale of a lingering spirit that makes itself known through the echoing, melancholy sounds of a phantom piano. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. Nathan Bryan Whitfield was born on September 19, 1799 on the family-owned Pleasant Plains Plantation in Lenore County, North Carolina. The Whitfields were a well-off family, and Nathan followed in his accomplished father's footsteps with not only a successful career in politics, but also a commission as Major General of North Carolina's militia. Then, in 1834, Whitfield moved from North Carolina to Marengo County, Alabama, with his wife and children, purchasing a plantation near what is now Jefferson, Alabama. They named their home Chatham, and although Whitfield was prosperous there in his financial pursuits, his family was met with a terrible tragedy when the area was ravaged by a deadly yellow fever epidemic, which would claim the life of three of the Whitfield children within a period of only several weeks. As a result, the Whitfields decided that the area around Chatham was not healthy enough for their family. So in 1842, Nathan Bryan Whitfield purchased 480 acres of land in Demopolis. The large family then moved into the two-bedroom cabin that had already sat on the property, but immediately realized that this meager home was not enough. So Whitfield embarked on a large-scale redesign and expansion that would ultimately take close to two decades to complete. At the onset of construction in 1843, the estate was given the name Marlmont. But in 1856, Whitfield chose to rename what was quickly becoming a grand estate, Gaineswood in honor of the land's original owner, George Struthers Gaines. Gaines was also a North Carolina native, born on May 1st, 1784. 
During his lifetime, he played an influential role in the history of early Alabama and Mississippi and was at one time identified as the, quote, patriarch of the two states, for it was with his help that the land was open for settlement by white Americans. Much of Gaines's professional life was spent serving as a federally appointed agent, working to build relationships and connections between the United States government and the native Choctaw people who lived there. And by all accounts, Gaines came to care deeply for the native peoples he worked with, believing, although misguidedly, that he could help the Choctaw establish prosperous lives away from Alabama and Mississippi. Gaines helped to scout suitable territory for the Choctaw to resettle on, and even helped to fund the purchase of some supplies for the journey. But whatever the effort he put in and care he had for the Choctaw, it would not save them from the tragedies of removal and the march that became the Trail of Tears. Today, an old post oak tree still stands at Gaineswood, the location of which is said to have been where Gaines met with Chief Pushmataha to discuss the terms of a treaty that would remove the Choctaw people. Nathan Brian Whitfield served as his own architect for the design of Gaineswood. He took ideas and inspiration from assorted pattern books and architectural designs that he had collected from his travels throughout the northeastern United States. And once complete, his mansion would become one of America's most unusual neoclassical mansions. In the mid-19th century, Classic Greek Revival architecture that had been popular among many southern plantation homes was waning in popularity in favor of the more Italianate design. So the result of Whitfield's work would be a predominantly Greek Revival mansion with flares of Italianate, making Gaineswood one of the few mansions in the United States to utilize all three different types of columns found in Greek Revival architecture, Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian. Of course, at the center of it all was the original log cabin built by Gaines. Construction of the home began in 1843 and continued until 1861. Although a number of skilled artisans were employed to work on the home, the majority of the construction work relied heavily on the labor of Whitfield's slaves many of whom were highly skilled in their area of artistry and expertise. Gaineswood was built using the technique of laying stucco over brick, and once completed, its exterior featured 18 fluted Doric columns and 14 plain square pillars supporting three porches, the main front portico, and in the rear, the porte cochere. Off the main north portico, and south porch sat ornamental gardens decorated with a marble statuary and surrounded by low masonry. The interior of the home was equally elaborate, with decorative plaster work throughout the main floor. But the library and dining room featured skylights, while other highly decorated rooms included separate reception rooms for men and women, a ballroom, and an elaborate master bedroom with a visually distinct sitting room. The second floor of Gaineswood was much more simply decorated for family use, but still contained a boudoir, the nursery, and four large bedrooms. After Gaineswood's completion in 1861, Whitfield hired a photographer to document his grand mansion. A Philadelphia engraver, John Sartain, then took the photographs to produce a steel engraving that shows Gaineswood as it looked when the Whitfields resided there. 
the massive front portico, an artificially created lake, ornamental planting, and a gazebo. Other structures on the site, but not visible in the image, include the detached kitchen and pantry, slave quarters, stables, and a plantation office, all of which were located away from the main house. Gaineswood was truly a grand plantation home, a visual representation of Nathan Whitfield's financial success. It is recorded that in 1860, just a year before completion of the mansion, Whitfield owned as many as 7,200 acres of land and 235 slaves. That same year, Whitfield's collective properties produced nearly 600 bales of cotton to be sold. It wasn't long after Gaineswood was built that Nathan Whitfield sold the property to his son, Dr. Brian Watkins Whitfield, who in turn sold the property to his younger sister, Edith. Edith owned the property until 1923, its possession leaving the family for the first time. And for years after, Gaineswood was retained as a private residence, changing hands several times as the decades passed. Then, in 1967, it was purchased by the state of Alabama with the purpose of preserving the house and creating a museum. But as with many historic houses and plantations, behind Gaineswood's elegance is the unfortunate story of a lingering spirit. It is said that after Nathan's wife, Elizabeth, died, Whitfield began to employ a young woman named Miss Carter to take care of his small children. Carter was said to be attractive, efficient in her work, and came from a suitable family. And although she was capable in her duties overseeing the operation of the Gaineswood household, she ultimately found herself homesick and very lonely. So General Whitfield invited her sister, Evelyn, to stay as a guest at Gaineswood for the winter. Evelyn Carter was an excellent musician, and throughout her stay, the mansion would frequently be filled with the sounds of the piano. Whitfield took a very special liking to these performances, as he himself was an accomplished musician, and at times would accompany Evelyn with his bagpipe. Folklorist Catherine Tucker Wyndham described this joyous time in her book, 13 Alabama Ghosts and Jeffrey. Together, they created stirring, rousing music that filled the spacious rooms of Gaineswood and spilled over into the countryside. Evelyn's presence at Gaineswood brought happiness and cheer to the entire family. In spite of a winter of severe weather, the coldest Alabama had experienced in many, many years. Life at Gaineswood was pleasant until Evelyn got sick. Then, after several weeks of care, Evelyn Carter died, and the cause of her death has been lost to time. Some claim it was the result of a severe attack of malaria, while others say she suffered from pneumonia, but most claimed it was the result of grief. During her stay in Alabama, Evelyn is said to have caught the attention of a young French count who came to the area to visit relatives. The man became a frequent guest at the mansion and a mutual attraction developed between them. Their relationship became serious quickly, and the man soon purchased an engagement ring for his new lover. But before they could wed, the couple got into an immense fight that resulted in the Count snatching the ring from his fiancée 
and angrily throwing it into the shrubbery as he left Gaineswood to never return. Evelyn was heartbroken and took to her bed, and it was shortly thereafter that her physical health took a turn for the worse. Evelyn Carter's death brought great sorrow to Gaineswood Plantation, but to make matters worse was the harsh winter weather that had brought so much ice and snow that returning Evelyn's body to her family in Virginia was impossible. So Evelyn Carter was placed in a pine box and sealed airtight with rosin to help prevent excessive decay. Her remains then stored beneath the stairs of Gaineswood until spring when she could be safely transported home. It was not long after Evelyn's death that people began hearing the sounds of disembodied footsteps as well as the faint noises of a tiptoed walk across the drawing room floor toward the piano before the sounds of Scottish ballads began eerily echoing throughout the house. The same tunes that Whitfield enjoyed hearing Evelyn perform. Some braver family members attempted to investigate the sounds, hoping to sneak towards the drawing room where the music was emanating from, only to have it stop upon their arrival. Yet once they left and returned back to their own bedroom, the music returned. But what truly distressed the Whitfield family was that some of these songs echoing throughout their house weren't just those they heard Evelyn play joyfully in life, but instead were the mournful sounds of, quote, homesick melodies of Stephen Foster. Clearly, the spirit of Evelyn Carter was unhappy. So when the weather eventually cleared, at the first sight of spring, the Whitfields were relieved to return Evelyn's remains home to Virginia, hoping that finally her spirit would be appeased and the evening music would come to an end. But the Gaineswood Mansion would again be filled with the mysterious sounds. The story of Evelyn Carter, the piano playing spirit, has grown much as a result of its inclusion in Catherine Tucker Wyndham's work. However, author Alan Brown questions the veracity of her story in his own book, The Haunting of Alabama. He writes, quote, As the docents at Gaineswood point out, according to the family letters, Whitfield was reluctant to send his daughters Edith and Betsy to any of the region's private schools. Instead, he hired a teacher, Elizabeth Robertson, and governess, Elizabeth's sister Charlotte, to educate the girls at home. Brown continued to explain that it was not Evelyn, but rather Elizabeth who fell ill and died at Gaineswood. However, unlike the more fanciful and well-known folklore Elizabeth's remains were not placed under the stairs in the cellar. They were instead placed in the Glover Mausoleum before being returned to her family in New York. Unfortunately, after an exhaustive search through both census and birth records for Alabama, Virginia, and New York, we were unable to find the existence of an Evelyn Carter or Elizabeth and Charlotte Robertson. So the mystery as to who continues to play the Gaineswood piano, remains.
Visitors to Gaineswood today can see the mansion as it would have been decorated in the style of 1861, the time when Nathan Whitfield lived in and owned the property. Many of the furnishings found on the site were also original to the Whitfield family, who have donated and sold much of the original family furniture and items to the Historical Commission for display. Gaineswood Plantation is truly a marvel to behold, an architectural reminder of Nathan Bryan Whitfield's legacy, as well as the purported home of a spirit whose presence continues to make itself aware with the echoing piano of its past. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you've been listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is an independently released podcast written and produced by Brandon and Brianne Schecksneider. For special access to members-only content, including access to the series Southern Gothic, The Monsters, as well as updates and links to our social media, visit southerngothicmedia.com today. Lucky Lady Shacks.